Good evening, and welcome to the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C.'s program with the authors of a fascinating new book, By All Means Necessary, How China's Resource Quest is Changing the World. I'm Heidi Shoup, and on behalf of the Board of Directors and members of the Council, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here this evening. With us are Elizabeth C. Economy and Michael Levy. Dr. Economy is the C.V. Starr Senior Fellow and Director of Asia Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. She is currently the Vice Chair of the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Council on the Future of China, and she sits on the board of the China-U.S. Center for Sustain Sustainable Development. She wrote The River Runs Black, The Environmental Challenge to China's Future, and has published numerous articles, including those in Foreign Affairs, the Harvard Business Review, and Foreign Policy. She received a BA from Swarthmore College, an MA from Stanford, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Michael Levy is the David M. Rubenstein Senior Fellow and Director of the Program on Energy, Security, and Climate Change at the Council on Foreign Relations. He was previously non-resident science and technology fellow in the foreign policy studies at Brookings and the director of the Federation of American Scientists Strategic Security Project. He is the author of The Power Surge, Energy, Opportunity, and the Battle for America's Future on Nuclear Terrorism and the Future of Arms Control. He received a Bachelor of Science with honors from Queen's University, Kingston, in mathematical physics and an MA from Princeton in physics. His PhD is from the University of London in war studies. Please join me in welcoming our authors. China's quest for resources so broadly, you know, from the, from the minerals to food, to energy to security to water and more. Uh, well, first let me just thank you, Heidi, for having us this evening and thank the World Affairs Council. It's a real pleasure uh, to be here and thank you to all of you for coming out on this uh, cold and chilly night. Uh, each of us probably has a slightly different uh, reason for why uh, we came to write this book. Um, I think for me, it really began initially a number of years ago as an outgrowth of my work on China and the environment. Uh, and uh, in my first book, it was largely focused on sort of the domestic considerations of Chinese uh, economic development and the ramifications for uh, the country's environment. Uh, but as I began to uh, look at it more deeply, I saw that what China was doing at home uh, was likely uh, to be what China was going to be doing abroad. Uh, and so that in many respects, the same kind of development practices uh, were going to lead to the same kind of environmental challenges uh, abroad that China was already facing at home. Uh, so that was my original impetus uh, for starting to do research on, on this topic back around 2006, 2007. Um, but as Mike and I uh, sat down and began to you know, think about writing this book together, and, and uh, it really became for me much more a function of um, sort of an issue that was at the heart uh, of China's rise uh, and really how China is uh, transforming the world. And if you look at this issue of China's resource quest, uh, you see that it does in fact uh, address all of those issues that we think about uh, when we think about China's rise and how China is transforming itself, right? What is China's impact on the global economy? Uh, what is China's impact on security? Uh, and what is China's uh, impact on global governance? the savior uh, of the global economy, or is it you know, the scourge of uh, global governance? And so these are the kinds of questions, uh, in, in many respects, that I think our book uh, tries to get at through this uh, prism of the resource quest. Uh, so for me, that's how it really sort of evolved uh, as an intellectual issue and challenge. So for me, I think I ended up at a similar place, but I got there from a very different starting point. First, I should, I should uh, thank you for uh, having us here tonight. It's great to be here. It's great to have all of you add that to, to Liz's thanks. So where I started was at the broad intersection of economics and international politics and security. 
if you look at how people thought about foreign policy during the Cold War, it was really split into two areas. We thought about economics and markets and how we dealt with our friends. And we thought about security and about an adversarial relationship when we looked at how the United States and the Soviet Union dealt with each other. And they were two pretty different spheres. Uh, but in most times in history, they're not so separate. And particularly when you see a rising power, rising economic power, increasingly taking broader political and security responsibilities in the world, the two tend to clash. And, and I, I've tried through a lot of my work to understand that intersection. Uh, Liz talked about her last book, Looking at China and the Environment. My last book looked at changes in the energy landscape and their consequences for economic security, for the environment, uh, to understand how those pieces uh, fit together. And, and as I looked at that, I started to appreciate that I, I would need to look a lot more broadly to really get a handle on this uh, place where economics and security clashes. So, uh, and that leads you pretty quickly to China. If you look at history, uh, rising powers tend to engender concerns on the economic front, political front, and security front through their efforts to secure resources. Countries can do pretty much everything else that they want to from internal resources. They've got people, they've got technology, they've got capital. But you have to deal with the resources that are on your land. And if you don't have them, you go out. And whether it is uh, in ancient Greece or Japan in the 1960s and 70s and 80s, this is an inevitable part of what happens with a rising power. I should say something about the last part of your question, why so broad? In order to get a real sense of what's happening, I do think you need to look across these different resources. Uh, if you look at people who study oil and then come to conclusions about China's resource quest, they have a very different picture of China and of the world than you get if you look at someone who studies food and China's resource quest. And we both talked about this early on, that to really get the full sense of what's happening, we had to look at a variety of resources. Uh, because it turns out that, what's, that the way China is dealing with each of these uh, varies enormously. OK. Um, let me go to your subtitle, which is how China's resource quest is changing the world. Give us a few examples of how it's changing the world. So there are obviously a lot of examples. Well, let me flag one uh, where I think it's probably had a, a bigger impact than in any other area, and the one that I look at for the future. Uh, one of the striking things when uh, we were doing this was uh, the repeated conclusion that China's biggest impact in a lot of ways has been through trade. So we focus on China investing in this or that part of the world or on the possibility that China might become engaged militarily or distort its diplomacy because of its resource quest. Uh, these are sort of sexy, exciting things. But if you really drill down on it, the biggest impact of China's resource quest so far in a lot of ways uh, it comes because China buys an enormous amount of resources on the market, but with very broad global consequences. And you've seen over the last decade enormous rises in the price of oil, of gas, of iron ore, of copper that wouldn't have happened had this demand, this huge demand, not emerged so rapidly from, uh, from China. And the consequences of that touches everything, not just the countries that China buys from, but other producers that are able to develop more resources and sell that for more, that has economic consequences, but also environmental and social ones. It also has a big impact on consumers around the world. Uh, we pay more for a lot of our resources because of this emergence of China. Uh, and so that, to me, is, is, is probably the biggest thing that's happened so far. When I look at the future, I'm very interested in what's going to happen with the security of the paths through which China's resources travel. Uh, we take for granted that you can produce oil in West Africa and have it end up in the United States or in Japan or any other part of the world. Uh, we uh, expect that this global economy runs seamlessly. We forget that it's underpinned by power. It's underpinned by decisions by powerful players about who can trade with whom. And if you look out to the future, uh, I don't think you can be completely certain that we'll have that same security underpinning. Uh, and, and I think if you're looking for big ways that China could change the world in the future, and